Welcome to this month's CMA Connect. It's great to have you all here. I'm your host, Aviva Michaeli. CMA is run by volunteers, and we're always looking for members to get more involved and take on leadership and support roles. So please reach out to your local chapter or national if you're currently unaffiliated, if you're interested in doing something more. CMA membership benefits and perks include a job board, a video library, member discounts, social media, and membership program and events. Please also add your information to the CMA directory found on the website. This is the best way to keep in touch with the contacts you make in the Connect. I will introduce our speaker in just a moment, but please note that there will be a Q&A at the end for your questions. Let's get started. Tonight, we'll be having an exciting conversation about producing and performing for audiobooks. Please welcome Julie Wilson. Julie is an audiobook producer and voiceover coach. By day, she is Director of Digital Pro Production Platforms and Strategic Partnerships, overseeing the production of all audiobooks at Penguin Random House. By night, she helps voiceover actors hone their craft. Welcome, Julie. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm happy to be here. So I have a first question for you. What are the pros or cons of audiobooks, focusing specifically on preschool through young adults? So I, I don't have many cons when it comes to audiobooks for kids. I'm I'm known in the industry as one of the producers who absolutely loves producing for kids and young adult. It is still a fraction of my list. I produce across all genres. Um, but one of the things I find to be really special is hearing kid characters told in, you know, kid voices as, as if you're speaking to them, as if you're meeting them themselves. So, um, you know, sometimes that's adult playing adults playing kids. Other times that's kids playing kids. Uh, I recently produced uh, the re-release of RJ Palacio's Wonder and did that with a whole kid cast and it's just really wonderful to allow kids to experience other characters who might be really unlike themselves and their own experience. Um, and there, there's just so many other use cases for kids to listen to audio content, either when they're alone or with parents or with their families. Um, so it's just a really great educational tool. And uh, other than that, how does it differ? For me, it's all about the content. I it's funny, I, I got this reputation for for only producing kids' books and young adult, which isn't true. I produce everything under the sun. Um, but I think it's just because the stories are really special. So I think what's unique about it is that a lot of adult actors can do adult fiction, nonfiction, but there's not a lot of adult actors that can convincingly be kids. It's a, for me, my, my expectations for kids stuff is so off the charts that I don't want to hear someone sounding overly cartoony or putting on a voice. I want it to sound like my friend's kids sound and they just sound like people. They're just, they're just really tiny people. Um, and finding that authentic sound is something that I'm always listening for with my ear. And when I hear it, it's, that person usually gets a lot of work from me. So on the production side, we're thoughtful about all of our casting, but kids stuff, when I'm speaking to actors breaking in, I'm really talking them through. One, is this something that you're interested in getting into? And then we're listening to samples to be like, can you do this convincingly? So um, probably performance is the biggest approach that's that's different from adult. Wow, I I hadn't thought about that before. That's really interesting. I even think about like how kids, sometimes they have difficulty uh, enunciating and you probably have to teach that as well. Yeah, it was actually interesting. So, um, and this, I'll lose the listeners who have, don't know Wonder, but Augie Pullman, who's the protagonist, he um, he doesn't have this, I don't know if they, he would consider it or, the, or RJ would consider a speech impediment, but he speaks in a particular way because um, he has physical differences. And so I ended up hiring on a kid actor who doesn't speak or enunciate perfectly because Augie doesn't. So thinking through really who this person is and how they would sound is the immersion that I that I love with every project. Wow, that sounds incredible. Wow. I have another question. Uh, what's changing in the production and positioning of audiobooks in the market leading towards podcasts? 
it's interesting because I, I, I want to call it a market leading towards podcasts. It's, I think there's such complementary mediums in an interesting way. Um, I actually spent about a year heavily researching podcast production companies because at the time in my partnership role, I was looking to see, was there an external podcast company that we partner with on certain types of full cast, multicast recordings that have, you know, a different actor for every role. And at the moment we've, we've pivoted into something else that I'm working on creating. Um, but it was really interesting to learn the ins and outs of all of their process. And I'd say, you know, um, there are a lot of differences there, but with when we can go into that in a little bit, but in terms of where audiobook production is going, there's a lot of more, um, I want to call it multimedia, but it's not quite multimedia effects. It's um, and leading towards full cast recordings in certain circumstances. Um, I'm working right now on a high profile nonfiction book. I can't name it because we haven't released all these details, but the author is a podcast host. And so I'm having him record the vast majority of the book, but I'm also pulling in archival content. I'm pulling in the different individuals who are featured throughout um, this book and like the methodology he's created. So as you're listening through, you're not just hearing one voice, you're hearing a full cast recording. And also there's sound effects, there's music. And with the archival, it adds such texture to it. But the truth is, one of the things I came across while I was researching podcast companies is just how much the, the literal format outline is different. So you think about podcasts, they're episodic. And for, for that reason, each of these moments need to have an arc that leads you wanting more. It, it's kind of like sometimes, um, what's the analogy here? It's, it's kind of like when a book is brought into become a movie, but they they chop it up. Like, I feel like if I release an audiobook as a podcast, it would just not be chopped up in the right way because books aren't naturally fitting in that format. They can be adapted to fit the podcast format, but it's, it's just a little different. Um, but one of the, I've been in the industry for 16 years now, and that's crazy to even me. Uh, but one of the things that have kept me there is that the industry just continues to evolve. And when I started at Penguin Random House, we were doing around 200 books a year. Now we're doing 2,200 and climbing. And that's just like across the board. There's so much content out there. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I never quite know where the industry is going. And I never quite know where my role is going because it just continues to evolve. Um, but one of the special things I've had at Penguin Random House is that I'd say every two years or so, I basically have a role that has never been created before because we're in a new landscape with the audio format. Wow. That's so interesting. <laughs> why now do you think, why now with the podcast? Why is it so interesting now? Um, if, if I'm just talking from a personal perspective, I think, I mean, podcasts were big before the pandemic, but think about what happened during the pandemic. And I think about my own personal experience and others that I know, we were all so isolated in a certain way. And so I needed, I, my personal experience was I was living here with a roommate and she left to go be with her family for six months. So I was literally in my apartment alone. And so what I did was I was turning to content and specifically I turned to podcast content because I felt like with certain ones, I was hanging out with some friends when I couldn't do that. Um, or I was learning something. I was keeping my mind occupied when we were kind of in this pretty traumatic situation in a lot of ways. Um, and I feel like people have held on to that. Of course, podcasts were rising before that happened, but I've heard a lot that the pandemic kind of accelerated the world in a certain way. And so whether that was, you know, closing companies or certain content really on the rise, um, that's, that's what I've personally noticed. I have this question of what's the distinction between a podcast and an audiobook? Uh, you briefly discussed this earlier, but I'm curious, kind of like technically speaking, how it's released and and what kind of people listen to podcasts and audiobooks. What are the differences? Yeah, it's the the format's different, like we talked about earlier. It's also you have to remember podcasts are not paid for content and audiobooks are. And so it's interesting. I know 
the podcast industry is struggling with this a bit. I've, I've observed that as kind of a mole at, at certain podcast conferences I've gone through recent, gone to recently. Um, you know, the idea when, when budgets go down as they have in the past year with certain things with, with advertising companies, um, where does the money come to fund podcasts? Right. And I, I was basically at these conferences being like, this is not my world, but I am observing everything that's going on. And um, it's a challenge that they're all facing, whereas customers of audiobooks are accustomed to paying, right? And that's good because it continues to allow us to make audiobooks. And when I'm going to create one, when I'm going to produce one, um, you know, I know we're going to have the budget and make back the money that I need to make the next one. There's, there's a very stable model there. Um, but what's always interesting about podcasts too, podcasts feel so much more spontaneous than audiobooks, And that has its pros and its cons. It's just depending on the experience you're expecting. Uh, these days, the interesting thing about audiobooks is that they don't always follow the print books format. We do all sorts of original content um, there's so many top of mind that I can't talk about that are coming out this fall, but there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Like one is a very highly visual book. That's, um, a, a very prominent celebrities book. And it's, we're adding a bunch of interviews because a, a highly visual book, how are you, how is that going to be an audiobook experience? You have to make it to this whole other thing. That's completely off the page. Um, so I guess they're not always not spontaneous, but yeah, I feel like podcasts feel like some, like sometimes they feel like, oh, I just stumbled in on this conversation and I'm learning something really interesting where I, I almost feel like there's something more intentional about audiobooks, whether it's you're just obsessed with this author or you have to listen to this book or this, this one topic that you really have to learn about. It just feels a bit more targeted to me. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up too, about the images in a book. Cause sometimes like, uh, I don't have an example off the top of my head, but there's an image in a kid's book perhaps. And how do you translate that to an audio audience? Yeah. I, I did this audio book series years ago and I hope people listen to it. You know, sometimes getting to a kid's audi audience with audiobooks can be challenging because you think about audible, it's the biggest online retailer and there aren't kids accounts. And so everything's run through parents, which is great in certain ways, but in other ways, like I wish there was a feature. So somebody make this up where like parents could just choose a library and just have like the kids section that they could go in and select their book. It'd be like their own virtual bookshelf. This is my, this is my dream. Um, but yeah, wait, I lost the train of <laughs> the thread because I got excited about that idea. Sorry. What was your question again? I thought that was great. I, know. I just got excited. Let's talk about images um, and how you translate. I produced this series, um, which I don't know if you guys know about. It's called The Three Ring Rascals. It came out seven years ago, eight years ago. I think um, they were the Cleese sisters. Kate Cleese, I think, was one of their names. And they they wrote this highly visual, such such a fun series about this circus and all, and there were different circus animals and there was a circus like owner and it was so highly visual and there weren't any, he said, she said, the lion said, the mouse said. So if you just read it as is, you would have no idea who was speaking. So what I did was I created a full cast performance with that. So there was a voice for the brother mouse and the sister mouse and the lion and all of the other characters. And there were some slight adaptations in there just to help listeners along. Um, so that one wasn't word perfect, but um, it made for such a colorful listening experience. You just, you feel like you're listening to a movie except for audiobooks. I find it's like somewhere between a book and a movie because a, a book so much you're creating with your imagination and of course, you have all the author's words and stories and all of that, but the voices, what you're visualizing, everything's in your head. And in a film, in a movie, in TV, a lot is fed to you. You you know what this character looks like. You know what this character sounds like. And then for audiobooks, you have 
the the audio, but you're still conjuring all of this in your imagination. So it's giving you something. Um, so I always think that's like a really interesting, I don't know, process or a way of approaching content, why you would go to audiobooks versus one of the others. I think audiobooks are an excellent place for kids to play too, because they can use their imagination in a way that maybe when they're focusing on reading every single word, which can be hard for kids, especially with learning disabilities, to really focus in on the story and imagine the characters. Yeah, it's really wonderful. I mean, like I was not a kid when I did this, but um, I absolutely love the Golden Compass series um, by Philip Pullman and just like favorite series of all times. And I used to listen and read at the same time just because like I just was so I thought his writing was just amazing. It was like the most amazing thing I had ever read. I did this also with the Harry Potter series because similarly, both of those audiobooks are just the best. Like if, it, if you guys haven't listened to any, either of those, like, please go listen to them. They will be something really special. Um, but yeah, no, there, there's so much good stuff for kids. We've done tons of picture books too. So if parents aren't around, they can listen and like read along. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of use cases for that. Or if you're driving in the car and the kids are in the car, I was, what was, um, I was in the car with my best friend and her four kids. And we were listening to Chrysanthemum, the mouse. And I think it was performed by Meryl Streep. And it was just such fun. I was like, we don't have to get out of the car. We can just keep driving. <gasps> That's so exciting. I have to listen to that now. <laughs> One more final question before we go to Q&A. How did you get started in voiceover work? What advice would you give to anyone looking to break in? And that goes for both the business professionals slash producers or actors. Yeah, so I I got in really early. I I joined um, the industry when I was a junior in college, and I I mean I've I got an internship for Random House while I was studying abroad, and I've been there ever since. Um, so yeah, it was it was a while ago. Um, for both business professionals and actors, I would tr treat them a bit differently. So. For any sort of person who's trying to get in, if you're early in your career and you're mid, mid in your career, anything like that, there's always bridges from what you do to what you want to do. And this is where the strategy of your career comes in. It's thinking about, especially if you're in kids content or any sort of like kids video games, kids animation, anything that involves voices, there's such a bridge to audiobooks. So I've won, I've listened a lot. I'd look for what are those strategic connections. And then I'd ask for those informational interviews. Those are some of the best things you can do. Um, you know, not always everyone has time for them. I go through phases where I'm like, I literally don't have time for this. And I go through phases where I'm like, all right, I need to get people. I need to help people. Um, but I think those are really key. And just having, um, being brave and asking for them is, is really, really smart. Um, and um, let me see if there's anything else I could give. Yeah. I mean, even I, and I say this for people trying to get into publishing and so that I can take a different um, approach to that. You know, if you want to get into audiobooks and you try and you, and you just can't get in, go into podcasts. Like we were talking about podcasts and audiobooks earlier. They are complementary. You'll learn not the same skill set, but it'll be very complementary. And it's like, I always feel like if you have your eye on something, it's really, really important to you then, and you're not getting it right now, just start to map out the steps that could lead to that. Um, so yeah, be strategic there for voiceover actors. I think what's really interesting about audiobooks is that they're really different from video games, animation, commercial, anything else, because I mentioned this earlier, there's such long form content versus short form content. So I'd say first, read aloud in your bedroom. <laughs> See if you like it. See if you want to read aloud for eight hours in a room. Some It's either your heaven or your hell. That's what I've experienced with most people. Some people are like, I get paid to sit here and read books aloud and embody all of the characters and use all of my imagination. And some people get put in the booth and they're like, this is, I can't even sit here. I'm like fidgeting, I'm moving, I'm having stomach rumbles and it's just really uncomfortable. And then what I would say is listen, always listen, because it's just a different approach than these other voiceover mediums. I always say that audiobooks, reading for audiobooks is a much more natural approach in general. Um, for a lot of animation or video games, you have to really make your voice really big 
it's it could be anal an analogy between stage acting and film and TV. You have to make things a little bit smaller on film and TV, whereas in on the stage, you've got to be big. And so I feel like there's a complementary analogy there between audiobooks and other types of voiceover. Um, and then the next thing I'd say is create samples. Um, audiobooks are not a reels industry. So like if you come with an audiobook reel, people won't know what to do with it. So create individual samples. Start with three, three different genres, about a minute and a half to two minutes each, um, and just work on your performance. Thank you. We'll now open up the floor to Q&A. Any questions? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll be as open a book as I can be, so. Hi there. Um, so I'm a, I'm a composer and a songwriter. Um, I'm curious how you approach music, especially if there's um, 2,200 titles coming through. I know there are not all kids titles, but is there a library? Are you using composers? Like, how do you approach that? We use DeWolf Music Library as kind of our standard, as something that we can always pull music from. We have a subscription to them. So they're they're excellent. I just was pulling music from them the other day. Um, but again, what I love about my job is every project's different. I am someone who's, it makes no sense that I've been at the same company my entire career because I'm insatiably curious. And it's basically because every single book I get, it's kind of like a new startup. You're like, what am I going to do with this? So I've worked on books that um, the author's a musician, whether they're a Grammy award-winning musician or someone who's always appreciated music throughout their entire lives. And so there have been certain, I, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, because this would be so good for you. Um, but there is one author, kid's author, and she is like an opera singer and a musician. So for her book, for one book, I brought in an actor who was also an opera singer so she could sing some of it. And for another book, I bought, we brought in a cellist and a violinist to play during certain moments. But it's because that's what the audiobook demanded. Like it needed that because it was so special in those ways. Um, I've also some more on the adult front, but I I produced Brandy Carlisle's audiobook. And so I worked with her and her team too. We actually recorded an album that did not exist before the audiobook and then sprinkled it throughout. And then later she released it on Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. So um there's so many interesting ways. Um, the last thing we haven't talked about, which is really cool, is graphic novels. Um, graphic novel adaptations. We I love producing those, again, full cast. And with those, um, we use music too and sound design and sound effects and, um, you know, if there's animals or wind or anything like that. So there's tons of different ways that music comes into play. Wow. We have a question from Hillary. Um, how did you decide whether to do a full cast audiobook reading versus a single reader playing every part? I'd say in general, these days, it's when the book demands it. So the truth is, you know, there are costs that come with full cast productions and full cast productions are really, really expensive. Um, and so it is, I'm trying to think of when Okay, one of the books I produced that I don't I don't think maybe you would have naturally read it and said this has to be a full cast production was Seth Rogen's memoir yearbook. So I ended up hiring 130 actors for it and it ended up in his in the moments where we go into his childhood, it ended up feeling like you're listening to super bad in a certain way because there was music, there was sound design, there was a full cast of characters. Um, and then in the adult moments of his life too. Um, but that was really special. And also we had a big budget because Seth comes with a big following. And so we were able to explore that and he has friends in, in great places. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's really looking at every project and figuring it out. I would say that for most books, they don't get the full cast treatment. It's like this tiny, tiny percent. Um, usually if they're highly visual in some way, um, we also, we distinguish between full cast and multicast. So full cast is pretty much, there's a different actor for every role. For multicast, it might be a cast of seven people and they're alternating chapters because there are different points of view and it's all told in the first person. Um, so yeah, it's a hard question to answer because if you gave me a book, I could tell you full cast or not, or what I wanted to be a full cast or not. Yeah, thank you for that answer. We have another question from Holly. 
It is clear that audiobooks have grown. Are they still growing? Has the industry felt a post-COVID slowdown? Thankfully not. We, we are still busier than ever. We hired 12 producers, 10, 10 producers during the pandemic, and we have more, more, more than enough work for them to do. Um, and we've also hired tons of assistants during this time. So thankfully, I'm seeing no slowdown, which is which is great. So we're continuing to grow. <laughs> uh, from Christina, for your job, do you always start with a written book and turn it into audio? Or are there instances where you begin with an idea in the audio format? Yeah, th so this is what we call original content, um, original productions. Uh, so we do do those. Um, yeah, when, when do we do original productions? Sometimes it's connected to an author who has a really big following and you want to do something special with them. Um, we've adapted plays from Broadway into audiobooks before, which allowed them to have a bigger reach than people that were able to attend in New York City. Um, what else have we adapted? Um, we have a whole originals team that's always evaluating this stuff. There is there is a, a comic book series, graphic novel series that I am dying to convert to audio. And we we're trying to convince the author. He like, I understand if it's highly visual, you can't use the bit, lose the visuals, but um, yeah. Uh, so it, again, I'm sorry. It's, it's not the best answer. It just depends. It depends on the circumstances. Thank you. We have another question from Holly. Do you direct talent yourself? or hire voice directors? So I do direct from time to time. It's always when I choose to direct, it's another job addition in addition to my job. So it has to be really carefully selected in my schedule. Uh, Penguin Random House is one of, the one of the existing publishers that still hires directors. And I think it's a really important part of the practice. So I'm, I'm the queen of saying, I want people to do what they're best at. And so when it comes to acting and, and narrating, I want actors to be doing their job. I don't want them to be self-criticizing when they're in the booth. And unfortunately, there's a lot of productions that are done without directors. They don't have that helping hand to help them along. Uh, but yeah, we have a st steady and always growing roster of directors who we work with. And I think what's really great about our pool is that everyone seems to have a different skill set and you know, we're talking about getting into audiobooks earlier. These these directors come from all sorts of backgrounds, film, podcasts, acting. Um, and I think what's nice about that is you think about audiobooks and books and long form content, just like in production, they all require something else. Each book also requires a different knowledge base and skill set. So yes, we're still hiring directors. It's it that we're like really careful about growing um, just because we have a pool and we want to continue the, to feed the pool. And if you get too diluted, um, you know, I don't know, we're really, we're really sensitive to all the people that we work with. Sure. We have a very timely question from Jerome. Is AI playing a role what? in any production process that you can talk about? And if not, do you anticipate that it might? Yeah, I, so I, in my industry, because I think I'm meeting a lot of you guys for the first time, I am the actor's best friend. My my dad was an actor on Broadway and musical theater when I was a kid. My sister was an actor on film and TV. Now she's a visual artist. And um, I, I created a global casting platform about seven years ago. So I'm personally always looking out for actors' best interests. Actors are my family. They're my friends. Um, we are not incorporating AI currently into the production process. And I think in the ways that people are afraid, that's not on our radar. Where I would love to incorporate AI, and I hope actors would be okay with this, is into the pickups. You know, pickups take up actors' time. They take up our time. If there's a way to do it, I always say, I was on this panel um, probably two months ago. And there was one guy who was like the AI guy. And I was the one that was like the bleeding heart for actors. And I'm all about things if we're done ethically, but I feel like where I get afraid is just, I know there has been stealing of voices. There's been articles written about it. And, you know, if someone chooses to license their voice for a certain price, like that's their choice, but it's more, 
in the stealing of voices and how that affects the rest of the industry as well. It's just like everything else. We don't know where everything's going. Um, we know that AI has already had effect on people's jobs and the creative arts. And I think a lot of us have been surprised that like it's kind of hit the creative arts first. Um, so not, I don't have, I never say never with anything because I'm one, not in control of everything, but it's also, I think it's the time for everyone to educate themselves, including myself. Um, that's like the best way you can prepare for the world to change. And um, yeah, my sister's a visual artist and there's so much digital AI art out there. And um, yeah, so I think just educate yourself, be aware and read contracts. <laughs> All great points. Yeah. I have another question from Hillary. Where did you get the most income from sales or rentals? I listen to a lot of audiobooks on the LA Public Library app, but do you make income from those checkouts? I got to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> it's because I'm just on the production side of things. Um, those are probably handled more by our editorial team and subrights. Um, so, okay, so you're probably talking about like one off sales versus maybe a subscription, I think, or maybe um, the truth is, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, the answer to that question. Sure. Oh, we have another question follow up uh, on Jerome's question about the AI and current strikes. How is that affecting audiobooks? So um, one of the things we're really proud about is that we have our own audiobook contract with SAG-AFTRA. So audiobooks are one of the current mediums that actors can work in. And that's great. We always love new actors come to us. We we love, you know, the, the voices we're casting for are people from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, they're voicing all different stories. So we love inviting people into the industry. Um, I feel like COVID was brought a lot of people in because people couldn't go into commercial studios anymore. Film and TV were shut down. And this could be another moment where people come to audiobooks because yeah, we're in great standing with the union. They they love how we treat them. So um, come along. That's awesome. Oh, got another question. How do accessibility slash ADA compliance factor into audiobook uh, production? It's something that we're talking about more and more. Um, it's, it can be a challenging medium in certain ways. And um, we're always trying to adapt to, you know, every type of listener that we can reach. Um, I'd say it's, it's something that we're really evaluating in this moment more than I have like a concrete answer to, because there's also so many different types of people in the world and also people with all sorts of visual differences, hearing differences, um, I did have a, a book recently. What did I do with it? Um, there was some, there were highly visual elements to it that we were just going to test. This is what we did. It's a young adult book um, that's coming out. And um, there were, there were highly visual elements that we were just going to put into a bonus PDF. And now that, that's kind of what we do with a lot of visuals because we're like, oh, listeners can access it. But obviously certain people who can't see, they they can't access it. So what we ended up doing was we I worked with the author to adapt some of the visuals and we continued to have the narrators say those out loud so that people could listen to it that way. But um, just like everything else, it's kind of on a case to case basis, but you know, we're always learning and trying to do our best in those areas. Well, if you don't have any more questions, then this has been lovely. Thank you all for coming to the CMA Connect tonight. And we look forward to hosting you next month. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.